Hello, and welcome to the Yukon RiverQuest pre-registration briefing for 2022. My name is Krista, and I am the Checkpoints Coordinator for this year's RiverQuest. Here is an outline of what this meeting will contain. First, I will talk about the land the RiverQuest takes place on. I will then give a quick race overview. Following that, I will discuss the volunteer boats that you will see along the race, some risks that you will encounter as a participant in the river quest, and some pre-race requirements that you should be aware of at this stage. The Yukon River Quest passes through the traditional territories of five First Nations and close to the traditional territories of several others. Please respect the river and respect the land. Please be particularly careful to not interfere with the various historical places, monuments, or artifacts that you come across. I will now give a short overview of the race. The full race is 715 kilometers long, though you can make it longer by taking the long way around several islands. There are several checkpoints and monitoring points along the race route. The difference between a checkpoint and a monitoring point is that times for each team are recorded at the checkpoints. These times are then relayed to the communication center and posted to the race tracker page on the Yukon River Quest website. Note that your map may not be accurate in detail as the river is continuously changed by ice and water movements. We had a very large flood last year, so particularly this year, you may find that the river is different from how you last encountered it or how it is shown on your map. The race will start from Whitehorse on June 22nd from Rotary Park. There is a split start with one fleet leaving at nine o'clock in the morning and the other leaving at noon. We intend for the slowest teams to be in the earlier fleet and the fastest teams to be in the later fleet. Exactly which teams will be in which fleet has not yet been determined. Please stay tuned for that information. The first major obstacle of the race is Lake LaBarge. This lake is almost 50 kilometers long and has no current to help you go downstream. Spray decks or spray skirts are required for several vessel types for passage across the lake. Please check the rules for details. There are several remote checkpoints and monitoring points along the race route. While you may stop anywhere along the race route, the crews at checkpoints and monitoring points will already have an established camp. The crews at these locations will likely have a campfire going, weather conditions permitting and there may or may not be a volunteer who is trained in first aid at any of these locations. At this time, it's too early to know if all the usual locations will be staffed this year. Please call out your team number as you pass either a checkpoint or a monitoring point, as this really helps the volunteer crew keep track of which teams have passed them. The two major checkpoints are CarMax and Minto. If you are doing the half race, your finish line will be in CarMax. If you are doing the full race, CarMax and Minto are the locations that you can take your 10 hours of mandatory layover. You may split the 10 hours of layover between CarMax and Minto however you wish, unless you arrive in CarMax after more than 28 hours of racing. In that case, you must spend at least three hours in CarMax. Even if you do not intend on spending any time in CarMax, you must stop and do what we call a touch and go. This is for your support crews to take a look at you and determine whether or not they think you are good to go for continuing on the race. There will be two CarMax locations. This is new this year. One location will be at Coal Mine Campground, where the CarMax stop has been for the past several years. The other site is the Bridge Site or Bridge Campground. This location is slightly farther downstream on the left-hand side of the river, near the bridge that goes over the river. Your vessel type will determine which of these locations you stop at, as seen here. At either of these locations, uh, volunteers will not be handling your boat or your gear. This is a job for you and your support crew. There will be volunteers at both locations who are first aid attendants but of note is that there is no medical assistance provided beyond first aid. If you need additional care, you will be referred to the CarMax Nursing Station or the Whitehorse Hospital. Additionally, 
the volunteer first aid attendants are not responsible for making the call on whether or not you are fit to continue racing. So just because the volunteer first aider doesn't say stop, that doesn't necessarily mean you are good to go. Please pay attention to what your support crew are telling you when determining whether or not to continue. Following CarMax, you will pass through Five Finger Rapids. When going through Five Finger Rapids, take the right-hand channel. As for Lake LaBarge, spray decks and spray skirts are also required for some vessel types for CarMax through Five Finger Rapids and also Rink Rapids, which are located slightly farther downstream. Again, check the rules. Minto is the checkpoint at which you must spend the remainder of your mandatory 10-hour layover. Notes from CarMax are also true of Minto, except that all boats will be stopping at the same location. The ultimate finish line for the race is Dawson City. Although Dawson City has city in the name, it is quite small. It has a population of approximately a couple thousand in the summer, and maintains a very rustic look and feel of the Gold Rush era. In this location as well, volunteers will not be handling your boat or your gear. The view seen here is looking to the right-hand side of the river slightly upstream. This is the view as you approach the finish line. Of particular prominence is Moosehide Slide on the side of the mountain seen here. The slide is visible well before you reach Dawson and is a very good marker to indicate you are approaching the end of the race. The timing line is just upstream of the yellowish building on the left. The boat takeout is slightly, though not much, farther downstream. There are several cutoff times you must make in order to stay in the race. You have four hours to reach Policeman's Point, which is at the south end of Lake LaBarge. You have 13 hours to reach the end of Lake LaBarge, 34 hours to reach CarMax, and 81 hours to reach Dawson City. Let's talk a little about the volunteer boats and what you can expect from them. The crews of the volunteer boats are not obligated to take on unnecessary risks to themselves in order to help you. Their own well-being is paramount. The volunteers will not put themselves in a situation where they may also end up in need of rescue. Not all volunteer boats or checkpoint slash monitoring point crews will necessarily have someone trained in first aid. You also cannot assume that a volunteer boat will be able to carry you out to somewhere that, say, has road access. You are responsible for transporting yourself out. This is a capacity issue, as most of the volunteer boats are full, just transporting their own crew in and out of these remote locations. While we intend for volunteer boats to respond to help and SOS messages, they may not get to you quickly and they may not get to you at all, depending on what situations the crews of these boats find themselves in. And you should be aware that there may not be any volunteer boats which follow the last racers. Let's talk about some of the risks you will take on as a participant in the Yukon River Quest. I should note that this list is not exhaustive. As of the date of this briefing, there is community transmission of the Omicron variant in the Yukon. While much of the race is in very remote locations, far from other humans, at some point along the race, you may well find yourself in close proximity to people you would not have otherwise had contact with. While racers and support crews are required to be fully vaccinated, breakthrough cases do happen, and you can thus become infected from somebody who is fully vaccinated. There will be COVID rules in place at the start line, the finish line, and at all places in between. Exactly what these rules will be is not yet known, so please stay tuned. We do expect the rules to include things like mandatory mask wearing, even in outdoor settings, uh, if you are in close proximity to other people. You might see some wildlife along the route. The Yukon has bears, both black bears and grizzlies, and equally as dangerous, the Yukon also has moose. We also have a variety of other animals. 
Due to how spread out racers become along the race route, much of the time you may well be closer to a bear or a moose than you are to another human being, besides your teammate or teammates if you have them. You may see the wildlife either on shore or in the river. The weather. The weather can be quite hot. On hot days, it can be over 30 degrees Celsius with over 20 hours of sunlight. You can lose electrolytes from sweating, and if you do not drink enough, you may become dehydrated. If you are dehydrated, you can consider drinking the river water. This is something that people do do very often. This does carry the risk of getting giardia. Of note is that dehydration is immediate, while giardia tends to take several days to set in. Both are bad. Use your judgment and choose the least worst option. The weather also can, and I dare say will, be quite cold. It will be especially cold at night, and the water is quite cold, about 5 degrees Celsius, and that will make it cold in your boat. If it rains, the rain is also cold. The water drops can be very close to freezing, and the air temperature can drop 10 degrees Celsius or more when the rain starts. Typical air temperatures are somewhere between 0 to 5 Celsius at night, 20 to 25 Celsius on a dry day, and 10 to 15 Celsius on a wet day. Varying degrees of hypothermia are quite common among racers, and more people quit because they got cold than for any other reason. Wind can also be a significant factor. Headwinds can be quite vicious. While most people associate this risk with Lake LaBarge, and it is definitely true of Lake LaBarge, Parts of the river can also act remarkably like wind tunnels. Storms can blow up quite quickly, particularly on Lake LaBarge, but also in other areas. And because of this, the conditions can go from fine to not fine in fairly short order. Winds can be a contributing factor to strained and or swollen wrists, forearms and back injuries, etc. The race takes place in wildfire season. So, if there are any active wildfires in the Yukon or any of the surrounding region, you may well encounter wildfire smoke. It is also possible that a wildfire could occur along the bank of the river, and you will see several examples of burnt trees from past wildfires. The water, as previously mentioned, is very cold. In addition, the river contains swift currents, eddies, cross currents, boils, riffles and rapids, submerged or partially submerged trees and rocks, overhanging trees, unstable banks, and steep drop-offs. Some of these risks will be evident, and some of them will be hidden. Beyond the confluence of the White River, where the White River joins the Yukon River, the water there is entrained with volcanic ash and silt. This volcanic ash is very small and very sharp and makes the water undrinkable without proper treatment. The Yukon River Quest is a strenuous, physically demanding race, and this comes with the risks that all such activities have. You will be putting your body under a great deal of stress, both physically and mentally. You can expect to feel approximately as worn out as this old Caterpillar engine seen here. Additionally, you will be quite sleep deprived. Previous year's racers have reported confusion and hallucinations. For example, I have heard stories of racers experiencing being attacked by an army of gummy bears, thinking Albert Einstein is in their boat, seeing people in lawn chairs along very remote stretches of the river, and we have seen cases of racers paddling upstream. All of the risks that are involved in participating in the Yukon River Quest are compounded by remoteness. That is, much of the race route is very remote and the time needed to get to any given location is substantial. Along the vast majority of the route, you will not be within sight of any of the race volunteers and may not be in sight of even your fellow racers. Thus, you must be able to rescue yourself. As an example that uh, shows the necessity of being able to rescue yourself, one year that I was stationed at Big Salmon, someone nearly drowned about 100 meters upstream from our camp. Due to the way the course of the river bends, I couldn't see them. 
Even if I had been able to see them, I wouldn't have been able to get to them since the volunteer boat was gone, responding to another incident. This person uh, couldn't get themselves out of the water and only survived because the tourists camping across the river saw them go under and were able to flag someone down. To further complicate matters, much of the race route is not accessible by flying craft. There are not many clear areas large enough to land a helicopter. There are portions of the river that are too fast, too narrow, or do not have a long enough straight stretch to land a float plane, particularly on the upper river between the northern end of Lake LaBarge and Carmax. The vast majority of the race route also does not have cell phone coverage, and some locations on the river may not even have good satellite coverage. The satellites tend to be in the southern portion of the sky, so if you find yourself up against a steep southern bank, you may not be able to connect out via satellite. It's also notable that satellite communication via spot and inreach devices and such can be very slow. Messages take time to send, time to receive, and more time to respond to. The reality is that if you find yourself in an emergency situation, the chances that you are encountering that emergency situation within sight of somebody else is small, and the response time of the volunteer boats or even emergency services will be slow. If you are experiencing something that is happening fast, like drowning, a heart attack, or a bear or moose attack, for example, we will not show up in time to help you deal with the incident as it is happening. If we can get to you, we will get there well after the incident is over and either assist in your recovery or attempt to locate your body. In short, there are many risks that you would take on as a participant in the Yukon River Quest. Consequences of these risks can be very severe, including permanent injury and death. I mentioned many specific risks here, but again stress that the list of risks presented here is not exhaustive. Let's talk about a couple pre-race requirements that you should be aware of at this stage. Tracking devices are required for all teams participating in the race. This device should be attached to your boat and not to your person. The ability to track you helps race officials, support crews, and fans track your progress. Your tracking device should be activated and in our tracking system by May 1st, and then rechecked in the few days prior to the race. You can find instructions on setup at the web address seen here. Contact senior timer Peter Coates to resolve any issues or if you have any questions. If you wish to make use of them, you can find the GPS waypoints that are used by volunteers in the communications room on the RiverQuest website under the Racer Info tab. You must also have a device that is capable of receiving messages and sending custom messages. This will help us determine what sort of help you need if you do send a help or SOS message, and it will allow us to alert you to things uh, that you should be aware of during race time. In addition to the briefing you are currently listening to, there are a couple pre-race mandatory meetings. There is the competitors and support crews meeting, which is often called the pre-race briefing. This meeting will cover a lot of the nitty gritty details involved in participating in the river quest, such as which fleet you will start with, details on which of the remote monitoring points are staffed and exactly where they can be found, etc. There is also final registration. All team members must be present at the same time and all team members and support crew will be required to sign a hard copy of the waiver that you have or will shortly sign electronically. Teams must confirm their intended stop times at CarMax and Minto. You may change this when you get to CarMax, but it helps our planning if we know what you intend. All participants must show documentation proving that you have adequate medical insurance for evacuation. All local racers must bring their healthcare cards. Team members will receive their racer packages and teams must complete the boat and gear inspections in order to receive their boat decals. Watch your email for details on exactly where and when these meetings will take place. In summary, the Yukon River Quest goes through the traditional territories of several First Nations. We are guests on this land and must respect it. The race will start in Whitehorse on June 22nd. You will lay over in Carmax and Orminto, pass several remote locations along the way, finishing in Dawson City. 
There will be volunteer boats, but their capabilities are limited, so self-sufficiency on your part is required. There are many risks to be aware of, many of which were mentioned in this briefing, but some of which were not. Communications devices have several requirements, and there are mandatory meetings prior to the race start. If you have any questions, please direct them to our race director at director at yukonriverquest.ca. Thank you for your time and attention, and I hope to see you on the river.